Um, but welcome everyone to three minute our three minute thesis competition here at the University at Albany. We're very excited for our first remote three minute thesis. So this will be fun for everyone involved, us and the students, um, and you guys as participants as as spectators. So thank you so much for joining us. Um, right now, Dean Williams will give us a, a, a welcome and then we will jump right into our programming. Oh, um, Kevin, you are muted. <laughs> and oh welcome gosh. to we welcome to our first here. Zoom three minute thesis. <laughs> uh, yeah, thankfully I'm not competing. Anyway, um, sorry about that. As I said, I should know by now. Well, uh, welcome to our third annual three minute thesis finals competition. This is clearly one of my favorite events uh, of the year and I'm so thrilled to see so many of you uh, here. Uh, this competition is first and foremost a celebration of the exciting and significant research being done by our graduate students here at the University at Albany. Uh, our students uh, are contributing to groundbreaking research across all the disciplines uh, on campus. And today's presentations will give you a, a, a good example of that research that's going on. Uh, for those who are not familiar with uh, 3MT, it is a, a research communication competition developed by the University of Queensland in, in Australia several, uh, several years ago, and has been widely adopted uh, at universities uh, across the world. Um, the exercise uh, developed academic presentation and research communication skills. Uh, it helps students explain their research in language appropriate to an interested but non-specialist uh, audience. Um, it's important to realize that it's not an exercise in trivializing or dumbing down one's research, but it forces students to consolidate their ideas, focus on the critical contributions of their research, uh, and explain the significance of their research to the, to, to the public. Um, we've had great success in our 3MT program. Uh, the winners of our previous competitions have done well uh, regionally and have advanced to uh, national competition at the Council of Graduate Schools annual convention. Uh, and just this past month, um, last year's winner, Erica Graham, a PhD student in nano, uh, nanoscale science and engineering, uh, won the competition. So there's no pressure to, to this year's finalists, uh, but, but we've had some pretty good success in the past. Um, I want to congratulate all the finalists um, who have made it this far. I hope it's been an enjoyable and valuable experience. Uh, I also want to thank the judges for today, Provost Kim, uh, Dr. Azalin, uh, Professor Ahmad, and uh, Jordan Nicely uh, from uh, Institutional Research. Um, we appreciate you taking time for your busy schedules to be here uh, today. Uh, finally, I want to give a special thanks to uh, Shanice Kent, uh, Assistant Dean of the Graduate School for organizing uh, today's event. Um, Shanice initiated the 3MT program here at Albany three years ago, and she's mentored and advised all the students, uh, student competitors uh, to date. So thanks, Shanice, uh, for all you have done to make this program a huge success. And with that, I welcome the competitors and turn it back to Soha. Thank you. All right. So um, before we jump into this quick overview, which uh, Dean Williams kind of mentioned most of it, so you guys can read it as I as I speak a little bit, some housekeeping. Um, as you could probably have noticed, your setup is very based on how you have your Zoom set up. So if you want to see the presentation and the speaker, um, there is a way to do that. If you just want to see the, the slide, there's a way to do that. So while I'm going over sort of the rules and all of that, this might be a good time to adjust your, your viewing settings if you would like that. Um, also, please keep yourself muted throughout. We don't want any distractions for our participants. Again, they are on a three minute timeline um, and on Zoom for the first time doing this. So please make sure you're muted at all times. Um, and if possible, when they start speaking, please turn your cameras off just so that if in their own view, they can see you guys, there aren't any distractions while they're trying to to speak and again um, get through their three minutes. Um, so I'm going to, as you guys have probably read this, I'm going to jump into what the rules are. So the rules are a single static PowerPoint slide. So there are no slide transitions, animations, movement of any kind on these slides. There um, also cannot be any additional electronic media, no additional props, 
and presentations are limited to three minutes, hence the name three minute thesis. And any uh, competitor who exceeds the three minutes is automatically disqualified. Um, and again, I'll be keeping time on my end. So as soon as you hear a beep, that means the three minutes have have concluded. Um, presentations are to be in spoken words, so no raps, songs, poems, um, and they are considered to have started once the speaker starts presenting. So as soon as our, our competitors begin, I will start our my, my time over here. Um, and the decision of the judges is final. Um, so who are our judges for today? We have Dr. Carol Kim, Provost and Senior Vice President for Academic Affairs. Dr. Martha, Martha Aslan, Director for Center for Leadership and Service and Assistant Service um, Professor in Educational Policy and Leadership in our School of Education. Dr. Ruxana Ahmed, Associate Professor and Chair for our Department of Communication. And Mr. Jordan Nicely, Research Analyst in our Office of Institutional Research, Planning and Effectiveness. Thank you again to all four of our judges for being here today. So our judging criteria, I'm not going to read all the bullet points, but the first two areas are comprehension and content. Um, and the second two are engagement and communication. So this is what our judges will be basing their scores off of. Our prizes, our first place is $1,000, second place is $750, third place is $500, and people's choice is $250. So people's choice are our our audience here. Um, at the end, we will have one slide um, that will have a link. We will send the link um, for you guys to open and vote for your favorite competitor. And that link will be available for five minutes um, for you to, to cast your vote. So with that, I am going to turn it over to our first competitor. This is Megan Appley from our Department of Chemistry. And her uh, project is titled Birds of a Feather, Forensic Identification of Endangered Parrots. So again, Megan, as soon as you begin talking, I will start my timer over here and I will mute myself and stop my video. So it's all for you. And if everyone else, again, please make sure you're muted. And if your cameras can stay off, just so we minimize any distractions for Megan. All right. Thank you. Hello. To start, I'd like to introduce myself. My name is Megan Appley, and I'm a fifth year PhD student in Professor Robbie Moose's lab in the, chemistry of, in the Department of Chemistry. My research falls under the area of forensic science. When most people think of forensic science, they often think about the overdramatized crime shows, which depict murder, rape, and other violent crimes. Although these are very serious crimes, it's actually wildlife crimes that have the greatest impact on the world as a whole. Wildlife crimes involve the illegal trading and trafficking of endangered plants and animals, which threaten the survival of many species and have even caused many to become extinct. A lot of attention is given to the poaching of ivory from elephants and horns from rhinos, but there's so many other animals that are legally traded, including a range of parrots. The parrots most in danger are those that can talk. These birds are often captured, smuggled out of countries and sold on the black market for extremely high prices, simply so that they can become someone's pet. These birds are also even killed for their feathers, which are used for jewelry and ceremonial headdresses. This illegal action surprisingly happens in plain sight. This is because there's a huge difficulty associated with identifying trafficked animals and materials made from them. Many endangered species of parrots look like those that are illegal to trade, and paperwork is often falsified to disguise the trafficking of endangered birds. This problem is only, only amplified when the material is disconnected from the animal, such as an individual feather. So how do Border Patrol agents or forensic analysts supposed to be able to figure out the source of a feather, of a headdress, or a piece of jewelry if they don't know what the original animal looked like? Most people would assume that DNA analysis can, can be conducted on the feather, but it turns out that that's not possible. This is because DNA from most endangered species have not been sequenced. My research explores a new technique to address illegal trafficking in endangered parrots. In collaboration with the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Forensic Laboratory in Ashland, Oregon, we developed a technique to analyze the feathers of endangered species of birds using a combination of mass spectrometry and statistics. So far, we have analyzed hundreds of feathers from multiple different endangered species of parrots, 
using a technique called direct analysis in real-time mass spectrometry, or DART-MS. This technique is extremely rapid and allows us to get results within seconds. The results of our technique show that every bird species has a unique chemical fingerprint that can be used similarly to the way our fingerprints can be used to identify a person. Except for in our case, it's a fingerprint that is particular to a particular species. This means we can use the data we collected to create a database in which forensic scientists can use to identify confiscated parrots as well as materials made from their feathers. Ultimately, this technique could have a huge impact on the fight against wildlife crimes. Thank you. Thank you, Megan. <laughs> All right. So next we have Loriana Gaudet from our Department of Atmospheric Science. Um, how much do cloud processes affect precipitation forecast uncertainty? Have you ever looked at the weather app on your phone and seen a rain emoji in tomorrow's forecast to then look outside your office window the next afternoon and see that instead it was snowing? If only you had known that snow was a possibility, maybe then you would have put on your snow boots, brought your snow scraper to work, and even left the office early to avoid driving on slippery roads. So why did your phone show that rain emoji? Well, simply put, it was showing you one possible forecast outcome that was associated with some uncertainty. Meteorologists analyzed an incredible amount of data from weather models run by meteorological centers around the world. Weather models use math equations developed from lab experiments and observations of weather phenomena to represent the processes that happen in the air around us and in the clouds that pass above our heads. When scientists use these equations in models, we typically need to make some assumptions so they can provide useful information but these assumptions aren't perfect and work better in some parts of the world and in different weather events than others. That means that the forecast may not always be completely accurate due to these assumptions, or as we call them, model errors. My research aims to identify model errors that are useful sources of forecast uncertainty so that we can skillfully point decision makers toward the likelihood of different weather events occurring. I specifically focus on model errors associated with processes that happen in clouds. Now, it turns out that the way that ice crystals grow in winter storms can change the amount of snow that falls to the ground. And the math equations that we use to determine how many ice crystals are in that cloud can change the type of precipitation that falls to the ground. It really could be the difference between a winter wonderland or a cold to the bone mix of ice, rain, and snow. Since no weather model is correct 100% of the time, it's important to consider all reasonable forecast outcomes to understand forecast uncertainty. To do this, forecasters use ensembles, which are a group of models that include very small changes to the observations they use or in the model itself to help identify the likelihood of different weather events occurring. One part of the ensemble may suggest a rainstorm and the other part may suggest a snowstorm. I've been focusing on how very small changes to cloud processes affect high impact forecasts across New York State. I've specifically been focusing on the most active cloud processes, which in one storm includes the growth of ice crystals and rain droplets and the melting of snow and grapple, which can be thought of as small ice pellets. When these small changes are applied to a process, the other cloud processes are also affected, but the forecast uncertainty changes the most where these cloud processes are the most active. While these small changes don't lead to as many forecast possibilities as other uncertainty techniques, they do increase forecast skill. So now you know just how important cloud processes are to forecast uncertainty. So the next time you see rain or snow in the forecast, you might wanna dig a little deeper to see just how certain that forecast really is. Thank you, Loriana. And I will give the judges a few minutes to submit their scores, and then we will move on to our next presentation. So this is Hisham Mohammed from our Department of Electrical and Computer Engineering, um, learning secure data transmission. So let me get your slide, Hisham. And then as soon as you start talking, I will begin my timer. Mobile applications play an important role in our lives, but do you think it's secured? Let's consider a scenario where you need to do a financial transaction through your mobile app using your mobile phone, which is connected to a Wi-Fi hotspot. Is your data secured? Unfortunately, no, since you use a wireless channel to send over your data. Thus, a hacker can capture the data and use it in an illegal way. You may say 
my mobile app is encrypted. That's correct. However, most of the mobile applications use a well-known encryption methods that they are known by the hackers. Thus, a hacker can capture the data and infer your credentials and use them in a legal way. So what should we do? In my research, I use artificial intelligence and deep learning methods to develop new encryption algorithms such that any, any transmitted data or any transmitted waveform over a wireless channel looks like a random noise to the hacker. To achieve this goal, I train both a transmitter and a receiver in a practical scenario where a hacker is included to learn new encryption algorithm. At the end of the training process, both the transmitter and the receiver succeed to learn a new encryption pattern that looks like a random noise to the hacker. Thus, secure data transmission is guaranteed. With this idea, I have published a one conference paper and another journal paper under review. Thank you. Thank you, Hisham. All right, so we have all of our judges' scores, so we can move on to Nidhi Nandu from our Department of Chemistry, looking at the picture differently. So Nidhi, I will switch to your slide, and as soon as you start talking, I will start my timer. Good afternoon, everyone. As Soha mentioned, I'm Nidhi Nandu, a PhD candidate in the EGIT Research Lab in the Chemistry Department at U Albany. Here, I work with nanoparticles and DNA to design nanobiosensors. Most of us encounter nanoparticles in some form in our daily lives, cell phones, nail paints, sunscreens. What makes them interesting is that the nanoparticles showcase different properties at their smaller scale as compared to when they are larger. DNA, on the other hand, is a very versatile molecule which not only interacts with DNA, but also other molecules like proteins and even large cells. One of the common designs for nanosensors is to use DNA sequences programmed specifically to interact with a target. When the target is introduced to this nanosensor, the DNA interacts with the target and we get a signal which has lots of information about the target. When I say programming DNA sequence, I mean that the sensor would have a DNA sequence to detect the young man in the painting on the slide and a different DNA sequence for the hut in the painting basically a new DNA sequence for each element of the target. However, we often see some background signal or noise due to off-target detection. That means the sensor with the sequence specific for the heart would give some signal even when the heart is not present. Researchers often see this as disadvantageous and try to suppress this noise to make the sensors more sensitive. I decided to look at this noise a little differently and see if I could get some information from this noise. To do that, I developed a non-specific sensor. Instead of using specific DNA sequences for individual elements, I used a few common DNA sequences along with different nanoparticles. When any target is introduced to this nanosensor, the recovered signal is due to a combination of all the elements of the target. I looked at the signal patterns obtained with the help of artificial intelligence. The sensor I designed could pick up minute differences in the samples and differentiate them. But how can this help us? Imagine a scientist working with cells and not realizing that the cells are mutated till it's too late. The experiments could be compromised, and this has already resulted in many retractions of publications. Being able to detect even the smallest changes in the cells could have prevented this. My sensor has already been able to differentiate these uh, differences in breast cancer cells. I, I have been able to differentiate even between different types of milk, whole milk, soy milk, cashew milk, and all of this done is used by using the same set of nanoparticles and the same DNA sequences. So thank you. Thank you, Nidhi. All right, we have all of our judges scores. So we will move on to our next presentation which is Jessica Summers from our Department of Anthropology. You don't get it till you get it. So Jessica, I will flip to your slide. 
And as soon as you start talking, I will begin my timer. Over the course of 18 months, this cultural anthropologist traveled the New York State Hudson River corridor to talk to people about ticks, their bites, and the diseases they carry. Lyme disease was the focus of my research and its preventive behaviors, and it spread through the bite of a black-legged tick. You can see a picture of a black-legged tick on the slide. And as I focused on my research about how people understand risk from tick bites and the diseases they carry, people talked to me about their Lyme disease experiences. And they said to me one phrase, you don't get it until you get it. And they used this phrase to underscore the realities of what I call their Lyme biographies, meaning the realities of what they experienced and suffered from having this disease and their finances and their personal relationships and their health and more. And so, if Lyme disease is known through experience, as they emphasized to me, could the same be said of Lyme disease risk? And so I asked one of the driving research questions for my study was, do people's regional relationships with the land, the environment, and their social relationships shape their Lyme risk biographies? And so my multi-sided approach helped me answer this question. People in the lower corridor in the Mid-Hudson region told me ticks were everywhere. And as I dug into the meaning of that statement, I realized they didn't just mean that they were under fallen leaves. Their presence, their sign, the sign of ticks was in their mind as they looked at on their lawn, a beloved extension of their home, but also in the bodies of their friends, family, and pets that suffered from the disease. But up country, it was a different story. This also includes the Adirondack Park, which is surrounded by a blue line. And there people told me there was no way Lyme disease could be there. And it was very hard to believe a tick and Lyme were there, even though the data said differently. And they told me it was a tough environment for a tough people. And ticks were a faraway problem for flatlanders to worry about. And so my research demonstrates the intersection of regional identities and tick infectious disease preventive actions or lack thereof. My work also advances infectious disease studies and, and social science intersections where we look to understand how people use infectious disease knowledge and use preventive behaviors. And it has practical applications for health communicators and their interventions which look to reduce the impacts of infectious disease in everyday life. Thank you. Thank you, Jessica. All right, our judges have a few minutes. Please submit your scores and then we'll move on to our final presentation. Um, and please don't forget everyone, stay on because once we have our judges scores from our final presentation, um, you will then be able to cast your ballot for people's choice. We'll have a link up at the end um, and you'll have five minutes to go into that link and vote for your favorite presentation. All right, and moving on to our last presentation. We have Ya Ying Zhang from our Department of Chemistry, Nature Strategies to Diversify and Stabilize RNA. So Ya Ying, I will flip to your slide and as soon as you begin talking, I will start my timer for you, okay? Uh, good afternoon, everyone. Today, I'll be sharing with you some of my words on RNA biology, specifically nature's strategies to diversify and stabilize RNA. What is RNA? RNA is a ribonucleic acid that's found in all living organisms, from humans to bacteria to virus. RNA is essential for gene expression. The outbreak of COVID-19 pandemic caused by the transmissions of SARS-CoV-2 and RNA virus RNA is the sister molecules of DNA. While DNA has a classic double-stranded helical structures, RNA is only single-stranded. Regardless, DNA and RNA share the same building blocks with a slight variation. After identifying the genetic sequence of the SARS-CoV-2 virus, scientists worldwide work together on the development of the vaccine. It is truly amazing from the day of knowing the viral RNA sequence to the first deliveries and vaccinations, the whole process only took about a year. However, synthetic mRNAs are easily degraded or broken down by the enzymes in the environment upon injections, which are represented by these scissors. When degraded or broken down, RNA loses its functions. This is also the reason why mRNA vaccines require low storage temperature. So how does the nature deal with the instability of RNAs? Can we learn from nature to find a potential solution? 
Yes, we can. In my lab, we study the nature's strategies to stabilize the RNAs with naturally occurring chemical modifications found on different parts of the RNAs represented by these colorful icons. Recently, we discovered a new modifications on the backbones of the RNA represented by the yellow ribbons. The modifications on the backbone drastically stabilize the RNA, much like providing a shielding against enzymatic cleavage. Hence, raw RNA function, uh, raw RNAs unstable, modified RNAs functional and stable. Considering that mRNAs is versatile, the coding message can be easily rewritten to adjust for the mutations in the viral genome. We envisioned mRNA-based vaccines to be the leading strategies in the future development. Moreover, if we can enhance the stabilities of mRNAs with uh, incorporation modifications on the backbone, such vaccines can easily be globally distributed since storage temperatures will no longer be an issue. In conclusion, being able to adapt these the nature strategies of using modified mRNAs to stabilize the mRNAs in the lab will enable for broad developments of RNA therapeutics including mRNA-based vaccines in the future. Thank you. Thank you, Ya Ying. While we're waiting, I just want to thank all of our presenters. Excellent job today. Again, thank you for being adaptable in regards to presenting on Zoom, doing this our first time virtually. Thank you again to all of our judges for being here, for joining us and taking time out of your busy days to help us with the three minute thesis competition. We truly appreciate it. All right, so um, Shanice just put the link for People's Choice Ballot in the chat box. So everyone that is here, please go to the chat box. You can click on that link. Voting is one per person, so please only vote once. And again, that link is available for five minutes. All right, so we have closed the People's Choice ballot. Thank you to everyone who voted. Um, and now I'm going to introduce Assistant Dean Shanice Kent, who will announce the winners. Make sure that I'm unmuted here. Thank you to all our participants, as well as our judges and um, our audience members as well. So I would love to get to announce that our first place winner is Jessica Summers. Our second place winner is Nidhi Nandu. And we actually have a tie for third place and our tied third place winners are Megan Apple, Apple and Ya Ying Zeng. And then we do have for our, our People's Choice winner was Loriana Gaudet. Thank you so much to everyone who participated. Um, to our winners, uh, Tara Curley, our Director of, um, of Finance and Administration, will be in touch with each of you to uh, process the paperwork. Um, thank you again. Thank you, everyone. This concludes our three minute thesis competition. Congratulations to our presenters. Great job. Thank you to our judges and thank you to everyone who attended today. We really appreciate it. We hope you enjoyed it just as much as we did. Thank you.